Welcome uh, to this roundtable of the Royal Anthropological Institute, um, which is the start of a series called Anthropological Responses to COVID-19. So there will be from now on um, every week an event in the next five weeks um, on that subject. Um, this is a bit of housekeeping just at the very start to get you all on the same page for this event. Um, we have two REI staff here today. Um, that's my colleague, Emma Ford. Hi, everybody. And that's me, Hanin Havik. And um, Emma is going to monitor the chat box. So if you have any practical questions, you can write them there. Um, anything that's unrelated to the subject of the, the webinar. Um, so all of you attendees, you will see uh, two buttons you can use. Um, one is the chat box, one is the Q&A box. If you're coming in on a laptop or phone, they should be at the bottom. If you're coming in on an uh, iPad or a tablet, they should be in the upper right hand corner. And if you don't see them immediately, just hover over the area or use the cursor and they should uh, be visible then. Uh, so please use those. Um, so the chat will keep just for practical questions, technical questions. Um, in the chat box, though, you can also use the drop down menu, as Emma said before, if you want to send a message um, to everybody introducing yourself, saying where you're from, for example, which country, make sure you write to all panelists and attendees. And that's the only way all the other attendees will read your message as well. Um, the speakers of today will not uh, watch the chat box for anything. That's what the uh, Q&A box is for, for questions later in the Q&A section. Um, so in the Q&A section, you can ask the subject related questions um, by clicking on the button called Q&A and then typing in your question and sending it off. You can send off a question anonymously as well by um, making a check on that little box next to the send button. And um, everybody will see all the questions that are coming in and we ask you to please upvote on the questions you think are interesting uh, and that you want to see answered. Um, this way, even uh, if you have the same question, you don't need to write it again. You just upload the question that's already there. Hopefully we'll have less repeat questions that way. Um, and we'll know what's of most interest. Uh, if you have a, a question for a specific person, please write the name with it. And then we know who to address in the round table group. Um, otherwise we'll assume it's a general question. Uh, we may not be able to answer all questions today uh, for time reasons, uh, but if you have still a burning question after the event, you can email it to info at the rai.org.uk and we will send it over to a speaker if necessary. Uh, also, please note that this event will be recorded. So if you um, write a question that's not anonymous, it could happen that we speak out your name when we read your questions. If you don't want that, Make an anonymous question. Okay, that's it for me. The housekeeping, I'm going to hand over to David uh, Shankland, who is the chair uh, and the director of the RAI. David, please. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Hanina. Well, welcome everybody to this seminar. Obviously, it's a great sadness for us that at present our RAI building is closed in the center of London, where we've had such wonderful seminars. But on the other hand, these new technology gives us the chance to uh, make friends all over the world and we're absolutely delighted about that. All of us as anthropologists of course have been thinking greatly about the application of our discipline uh, in, to the present crisis and in order to start our discussions in a more formal way we are absolutely delighted to have a first class group of speakers with us today. Uh, in order of speaking that's uh, Professor Robin Dunbar, the Emeritus Professor of Evolutionary Psychology at the University of Oxford, Professor Melissa Parker, uh, who's a professor of medical anthropology in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Dr. Hayley McGregor, who is a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies. I think we shouldn't break into the seminar time to give any more detailed introductions, but they are indeed most distinguished uh, uh, colleagues and, and academics. But I would just like to say, uh, if you feel like joining the RA and becoming a, a fellow of the RAI, please feel free to do so. The RAI can only exist because it attracts anthropologists from all over the world who are prepared to join us and help our work and contribute to it, uh, to give something and also I hope to learn something. So please do feel free to join us if you haven't joined us already. And you can 
look at the uh, way to do that uh, from our website, which is simply www.therai.org.uk. So thank you very much. And now we turn to our first speaker, uh, Professor Dunbar. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, probably good evening to you if you're uh, uh, well east of here or good morning if you're to the west. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about uh, things that are very uh, uh, much part of our everyday life. That's really our, our, our friends and, and close family members. Um, these are actually much more important to us than we often tend to think. We tend to kind of ignore them really as much as, as, uh, uh, as anything, uh, simply because they are just part of the fabric of our life, but actually they turn out to have a huge influence uh, on our health and well-being, um, our whole social attitude, if you like, to, to, to life in general. Uh, we've actually done a number of uh, large-scale surveys um, to look at this. Um, one was looking at social uh, eating, how often people ate uh, socially um, at lunchtime or in the evening. One was looking at people's um, uh, drinking habits, how often they went to the pub with friends and so on. And one was looking at uh, how often they attended um, their respective religious establishments, how often they went to church or mosque or whatever it might be. And one of the striking features to come out of that was that the more often you did these things, and all three of them are very social in that uh, sense, the more often you did that, the more close friends you had. And the more close friends you had, the happier you were, uh, the more satisfied you were with your life, uh, the more engaged you were with the wider community within which you lived, beyond your immediate friends and families you were. And indeed, the more trusting you were of people outside your, your immediate family and friends, the more trusting you were of strangers coming into your community and so on. So all these sort of social activities and the kind of network of relationships that they create for us have ramify all the way through, not just our own personal physical well-being and health, but also uh, through society itself in effect. Um, the, the social world in which we live is actually quite complexly structured. Um, um, we do have a kind of outer limit on the number of people that we can think of as meaningful friends and family. That's at about 150 people. It varies between about 100 and 200 across uh, individuals. It seems to be very constant across societies and even through time. Um, uh, but that sort of extended network, as it were, really consists of a series of layers of friendship. And by friendship here, I'm including family members, so extended family members. About half of our 150 uh, um, social network actually consists of extended family members, even here in, in, in Europe, where we you know, have small families and therefore relatively small extended families. Um, but within that, there are a series of layers of friendship which get smaller and smaller as they come in towards you, um, but more and more intimate and emotionally close. So it's a bit like the ripples on a pond where you throw a stone in. If you think of yourself as the stone being thrown in, you've got these ripples going out. Of, uh, which are increasingly large, include more people, but they get small, the ripples get smaller, the emotional closeness gets smaller. Uh, and it's really those inner core layers of about five friends. I, I, these days I tend to call them the, the shoulders to cry on friends because they provide you with uh, real uh, deep support um, in terms of times of crisis. They're the ones that, you know, come what may, will uh, drop everything and bail you out and, uh, and help you out uh, when your life falls apart. Um, these friendships all require huge time investment. They're actually very, very costly for us. And, and at one level, uh, the amount of time we invest in a friendship is actually crucial because that actually determines how close that friendship will be and therefore how willing the person is to drop everything and come and help us. Or, you know, even if it's a small thing or a big thing, uh, it's affected by how much time we invest in them and how much time, of course, they invest in us. 
So in those terms, the, the key ways we really do that, obviously we do a lot of it through, through conversation and stuff, but there are lots of other things we do which become really fundamentally important uh, over and above just talking. So there's, there's sort of the process of creating friendships goes on below the surface, if you like, below the, the conversational surface that are really quite important. And these have to do with things like physical touch, uh, the amount of laughter we have, engaging in singing and dancing with each other, uh, feasting, um, uh, socially eating and drinking with, with each other. And interestingly enough, uh, storytelling and particularly emotional storytelling. What all of these do is trigger the endorphin system in the brain and the endorphin system, which are part of the pain control system, gives us this warm feeling of uh, coziness and contentedness and feelings of trust, trustingness um, and bondedness that, that give rise then, then to friendships. Now, of course, what's interesting about all, most of those activities really is they're extremely difficult to do online. So in these days when we're locked down, uh, uh, you know, is it possible uh, to um, maintain friendships? Uh, and this may be very important because of the rate at which friendships in particular, not so much family relationships maybe, but friendships in particular, kind of decay if you don't see and engage with the particular individual. And that actually happens very quickly in the course of a couple of months of not seeing somebody. Um, that relationship will start to decay and uh, the decay and they'll drop down through the sort of ripples on the pond of your social network and sort of disappear off, eventually disappear off the other end, although that may take a while. Um, so it's an interesting observation, I think, to, to see the extent to which uh, people have been kind of trying to exploit um, virtual technology to kind of recreate virtual uh, handshakes and virtual uh, um, get-togethers uh, among their family and friends. Uh, obviously, famously, people have been singing off their balconies. I mean, you know, clearly in Italy, uh, where they do proper singing, you can do kind of Verdi operas and things, and it's all absolutely spectacular and wonderful. Uh, but even here in Britain, people have been uh, sort of singing uh, folk songs and well-known songs uh, from from their from from their windows. Um, and that way, clearly, we can build up um, uh, relationships. But the, the key still is that's just with your neighbors and maybe not with your best friends and family who may be living away. Uh, and another thing I've noticed people doing a lot of is virtual dinners. So they'll have the, 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 the same recipe, they'll all have cooked the same food, and they can sit down and, and um, uh, go through the meal uh, course by course with each other. Um, Interestingly enough, that's nearly always with family. I've, it, I've not really heard that being done with friends so much. It seems to be done a lot with family. And actually one of the things that struck me as a casual observation is the extent to which families have been kind of reconvening virtually in a way which they didn't necessarily normally do before. And people I've heard actually say, you know, gosh, you know, we should do this more often. You know, it's years since we got together. Now we've got the whole family together on Zoom or whatever it may be. Uh, we should actually try and do this more often. I, I'm not sure really in the end whether that will work after we've been let out back into the playground of life again, perhaps because, you know, it's not quite the same. And the, the, the problem, I think, with the way we make our friendships is it really does depend on physical proximity. It depends both on a lot of physical touch. We, we do a lot of sort of stroking on the arm and arm around the shoulder and uh, these kind of things without really thinking about it. And those those behaviors turn out to be extremely important. Um, and it's, it's, there's something about the immediacy of being able to stand in front of somebody and see the whites of their eyes, which seems to be very important. And we kind of picked this up in some of our research, which has been looking at how effective some of these different modes of communication actually are. And, and it's clear that there is nothing to replace face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, these kind of video-based, um, uh, 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 interactions um, uh, on, in the digital world do surprisingly well, but still they leave a lot to be desired. I mean, they, they're clearly much, much better than things like um, uh, text-based uh, media, um, like, like Facebook and messaging and, and, and email and so on. 
people get much more out of them. But still, it's very difficult to manage a conversation um, a, 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 online, and, and particularly so because what would normally happen if you if you were all sitting around the table somewhere was that there'd be three or four conversations going on, whereas online, you know, it's a bit more like a lecture. You can only have one person talking to the entire assembled company. So the question is, I guess, uh, really just to sort of uh, bring this to a, a, a conclusion, is what effect is uh, lockdown going to have on us and our relationships? I'm actually fairly upbeat about this because I think so long as it doesn't carry on for too long, then it really won't have that much effect. People will just you know, get out and get on with life once again, much as they did before. If it carried on for a very long time, then I think uh, there would be um, start to be much more serious consequences. Um, I think we will see some changes uh, uh, or starting, you know, as soon as people uh, are allowed formally to reconvene again in public. Um, one of those is simply a sudden upsurge in people contacting friends in particular, but also family probably, uh, to meet up with them. Because we've seen that going on even in telephone call databases when we've analyzed them, that if you haven't called somebody for uh, a couple of weeks when you normally call them every other day, that next phone call is much, much longer. And so you're kind of making up and, and, and not so much apologizing, but trying to sort of repair any cracks that might have might have occurred I, I think there will be a slight uncertainty about particularly among sort of medium level friendships not your best friends but among sort of the, the next layer out of friends as to exactly where your relationship lies you know, has it changed actually in the meantime because it might have done because you've met some people in your road and spoken to them and developed a, a friendship with with somebody nearer and that that's always a problem but i think aside from that probably the only um, uh, comment that i would make in these terms is simply that if you ask who is going to sort of experience this whole process as more taxing uh, psychologically and socially, I, aside from the older people who, who are already uh, uh, sort of a little isolated usually, um, probably the girls are going to ha ha have more trouble with it than the boys. And that's simply because it seems that w women and girls' relationships, friendships are much more intense uh, and, um, and in many ways fragile compared to those of boys. Boys seem to live in this kind of here today and gone tomorrow and out of sight, out of mind social world, I'm afraid. Uh, and so not being able to see your friends is, uh, well, you know, who cares? Whereas it's much more meaningful uh, for, for girls in particular. I think probably sort of younger teenage girls and, and, uh, are going to be the ones that are going to experience this as the hardest thing to do. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to sort of hand the baton over at this point to Melissa and Haley uh, to take the, the, the next part forward. Thank you, Robin. It's, um, it's great to be here and um, Haley and I are going to, we've written our talk together, so we're going to present it and move back and forth. So our talk today pulls together some of the central issues emerging from ongoing research on several closely related projects. Today, Haley and I are going to look at global framings of preparedness and response led by the WHO. And we shall not only reflect on the connections and disconnections between these framings and the design of national policy in South Africa and Uganda, but also how these international and national framings relate to the realities on the ground. Our paper has been jointly written. So to reflect this, we shall move back and forth during our talk. As we do so, it will become clear how the political histories and presence in each country, as well as past experiences of epidemics such as HIV AIDS and Ebola, are shaping government responses. The situation is dynamic and fluid, and there are, of course, countless uncertainties. But as things stand, lockdowns in both countries are revealing and intensifying long-standing inequalities and the relationship between formal, hybrid, and informal public authorities are, like, are likely to profoundly shape the course of the outbreak. 
These provisional findings are important, not least because they challenge global framings of disease preparedness and response, including the notion of a standardized approach to preset phases of an epidemic. So let us start with global epidemiological framings of preparedness and response. Well, in recent years, fears about deadly infectious diseases with pandemic potential have crystallized in the restructuring of institutional architectures within agencies with a global health remit, alongside initiatives to predict, prepare and respond to epidemics. The 2013-15 Ebola outbreak in West Africa was a key episode in episode in galvanizing global attention towards disease preparedness activities. Now, the idea of preparedness marks a departure from prevention. Preparedness has been characterized by Lakoff as involving, I quote, the construction of potential futures in the realm of disease threat and an anticipatory imagination amongst policymakers through practices geared towards surveillance, early warning, scenario planning, and preemptive pre control in the event of outbreaks. Indeed, there have been a host of global plans, meetings, and reports for this version of disease preparedness. The WHO approach has involved assessing risk and system readiness and identifying a list of priority pathogens, including the unknown disease X. In 2016, the Commission on a Global Health Risk Framework for the Future concluded that the world remained unprepared for future epidemics, arguing for greater investment. In 2017, WHO established its guidelines for health emergency preparedness, extending the ambit of the 2005 International Health Regulations and elaborating the Joint External Evaluation Tool to assess preparedness. Now, in the WHO schema, preparedness precedes a phase of outbreak response. To streamline response, the WHO established in May 2016 a health emergencies program, and again I quote, designed to bring speed and predictability to the WHO emergency work, encompassing all stages of the emergency cycle from preparedness to recovery. The centralized system relies on clear command and control and identifies defined pillars of response, such as surveillance, infection prevention, risk communication, and community engagement. Response is situated within a health security paradigm that assumes a singular focus to contain one health emergency through progressive temporal stages. Now, this highly technical approach is posited as following the signs through set plans and phases. It assumes that sociopolitical issues are appropriately confined to the realms of risk communication and community engagement. While some useful work indeed happens under these pillars, this is not necessarily the case, an issue we can perhaps pick up in the discussion. But for now, it's important to emphasize that the whole approach fails to recognize that public health is a social practice and profoundly shaped by the sociopolitical context in which it's designed and implemented. While many privately do acknowledge this, the nature of collaborations created by WHO require the development of a seemingly off the peg technical set of solutions. Unsurprisingly, and not unreasonably, governments adapt these technical guidelines and recommendations as best they can to the situation they face. And it's not straightforward. Take the case of Uganda. Last March, I attended a national task force meeting at the National Emergency Operations Center in Kampala with my colleague, Grace Akello. Staff at the center were acutely aware of events unfolding in China, South Korea, and Northern Italy. And they were faced with the, challenging, <clears throat> with the challenge of preparing Uganda for an outbreak of COVID-19, while simultaneously dealing with ongoing outbreaks of yellow fever, typhoid, TB, and malaria. Ebola was on the wane in DRC, but they were more than aware that this could change and there was a serious risk of Ebola spreading across the border to Uganda too. How then does a government prepare for an outbreak of an unknown disease in the context of other serious outbreaks? With limited funds, it is not at all clear whether it's appropriate to pull funds from one disease to prepare for another. Technical guidance provided by the WHO from past out outbreaks proved influential. The very same pillars they had advised to use for Ebola were rolled over for COVID-19. 
Even those pillars, which almost certainly require alteration to engage diverse groups were left unchanged. Staff running the risk communication pillar, for example, seemed unaware that it might be insufficient to ask people to self-isolate if they thought they'd come into contact with an infected person. When we pointed out how crowded living spaces could be with 12 or more people sharing a couple of rooms, the response was, then they should go and stay in a hotel. But it was not long before even these issues started to feel inconsequential. From the outside, it might look as if the Ugandan government was quick off the mark. This tweet by President Museveni, for example, conveys an acute awareness of the need to be prepared. Following a presidential address on March 18th, he closed schools, suspended markets and religious gatherings and outbound travel to countries such as Italy, South Korea and China were prohibited. Citizens returning to Uganda were placed in quarantine and political rallies forbidden. And all this happened before Uganda registered its first case of COVID on March the 23rd. Additional decrees swiftly followed, including the suspension of all forms of public and private transport, and non-essential movement, even by foot, was discouraged. Crucially, power was taken away from the Emergency Operations Centre, and all decisions now have to be authorised by the Office of the Prime Minister, with a military figure heading operations. The overt militarisation has brutal dimensions. This picture was downloaded from the web and it was taken in Kampala, but it resonates with the reports sent by colleagues at research sites in Western, Northwestern and Northern Uganda. At one field site, which lies on the Uganda DRC border, close to Kasesi, women have been beaten for attempting to cross a river to cultivate their crops on land which is owned or rented on the DRC side of the border. At another site in Nebi district, which lies more than 400 kilometers further north on the shores of Lake Albert, but also on the Uganda side of the DRC, people were not only beaten, but live shots were fired by soldiers into a weekly fish market. All this happened within a few hours of the president declaring that markets should close. In other words, before the news had spread that such activity was prohibited. One of my colleagues writing about the same place, but a few weeks later, sent this account. At 7 p.m., the usual curfew time, armed men start patrolling the streets. They normally whip whoever they find on the streets and then pound bicycles or boda bodas during curfew hours. One day, a renowned pastor was returning home from the trading center. He saw soldiers and crossed to another street. Unfortunately, they followed him. His motorcycle was impounded. They beat him up until he lost consciousness. After hours of lying on the ground, his flock converged at the scene and took him for treatment at the health centre. Restricting movement and closing markets is likely to have profound socio-economic ramifications. It's also affecting access to biomedical healthcare. Indeed, at one site in northern Uganda, these restrictions are preventing villages from accessing much needed antiretroviral treatments for the treatment of HIV. Here, it's important to note that during the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, more people ended up dying of malaria and diarrheal diseases than ever died from Ebola. Hopefully, similar issues will not arise from COVID, but this is looking unlikely. For COVID is accentuating social inequalities and reinforcing the marginality of already marginalized groups. Take the case of Gulu district in Northern Uganda. Thousands of children were abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army in the late 1990s and early to mid 2000s. Many subsequently returned home in the mid to late 2000s having spent time at internationally funded reception centers. I've been working with colleagues from the LSE and Gulu University since 2013 to document some of the longer term impacts of abduction for their health and well-being. Our work has highlighted how the vast majority of returnees feel excluded, with those living in rural areas rather than towns particularly struggling. They have become, if you like, an underclass of an underclass. 
The current restrictions on movement are affecting this group. One former child soldier contacted a colleague last week to say, if they don't end lockdown soon, we shall die from hunger. And another rang, distressed, to say that she had been chased from her village, accused of being a witch. When resources are stretched, marginal groups are rendered ever more vulnerable. The situation in Kasesi, Nebi and Gulu districts is of course volatile and changing fast, and the long-term socio-political ramifications are far from clear. President Museveni, for those that do not know, has been in power since 1986. In 2018, at the age of 73, he managed to pass a law which removed the 75-year age cap for presidential candidates, thereby ensuring that he could run for re-election in the 2021 elections. In recent years, he has ruthlessly pursued a policy of threatening, beating up and imprisoning opposition leaders. Early indications suggest that he is using COVID-19 to continue to assert his authority, while simultaneously mobilizing a political narrative of preparedness to keep influential donors on board. At all field sites, colleagues report fear. This is not for COVID, which official figures suggest has infected 797 people and led to no deaths. Rather, they are fearful for the political future facing ordinary Ugandans. National politics aside, it is more than likely that past and current experiences of epidemics will be influential, with formal and informal public authorities shaping the course of COVID with heterogeneous impacts. We saw this in Sierra Leone, where recent work carried out with colleagues at Najali University and the LSE revealed how a morally appropriate people's science emerged under the radar of chieftain authorities. In one particular village, this involved the creation of homemade personal protective equipment. The influence of formal and informal public authorities is starting to become evident in Kasesi district where latest accounts indicate that militia groups residing within the village are coordinating with those in DRC to resist the military presence. Connected to this, a spirit which lives in the river valley is terrifying the soldiers. To quote the words of a man living in the study village, the soldiers reported the threat of the voice of the spirit to their commander, who also went there to see what was happening. When night came, the spirit slapped the commander this is when he decided that his soldiers should no longer watch the river beyond nine o'clock at night. Ongoing ex exploration of the relationship between militia groups, the local council representatives and the army is clearly going to be important when it comes to understanding the future course of the outbreak. So let us now turn to the situation in South Africa. In early February, I was a delegate at the WHO R&D roadmap meeting when the disease caused by the novel coronavirus was named COVID-19. The focus was the identification of research priorities in the face of enormous scientific uncertainty. Africa CDC reported that only two laboratories on the continent had the expertise to identify the virus, one of these in South Africa. Shortly after the meeting, I went to South Africa where there was still little public concern. In an inversion of the usual outbreak narrative of pathogens emerging from Africa, people saw it as remote affecting other continents. However, amongst policymakers, I detected concern. I was there for fieldwork on tuberculosis. A provincial head of infection prevention moved our meeting because she had, she had been told to get on the road to inspect clinics for COVID readiness. The newly received WHO guidelines were not, she told me, for developing country contexts. Apart from this challenge of adaptation, I sensed her discomfort at the call to shift attention. Her day-to-day -day brief is dominated by two chronic infectious diseases, TB and HIV. What would the implications be of diverting resources? In 2018, 63,000 people died of TB in South Africa, and it's the leading cause of death. There are 7 million people with HIV in a population of 59 million. Amongst health workers, I detected disquiet about emerging clinical data, worrying because of the long under-recognized burden of non-communicable disease in South Africa, 
a neglect partly due to the prioritization of the HIV epidemic over two decades. But the bigger clinical unknown related to how severe COVID-19 would be in people with TB and poorly suppressed HIV. Beyond concern about these so-called multi-morbidities loomed the plain fact of limited critical care capacity. Even in one of Africa's most resourced state health systems, the estimate in March was of 4,000 ventilators in the private health sector and only 2,000 in state facilities. In one of the most unequal countries in the world, the state health sector supports the majority of the population, but a much greater proportion of overall healthcare spending is in private. Plans to redress this through a national health insurance have faced a political battle. It was at a meeting in late February in the Department of Health that I heard that a man returning from Italy had tested positive in private as the first identified case. As anthropologists Manderson and Levine pointed out at the time, the virus would likely be brought into the country by wealthy citizens, but an epidemic would run along fault lines of inequality and hit the poorest those in densely populated, low-income and informal urban areas, dogged by long-standing structural violence, living under conditions that would make public health measures like hand washing and physical distancing a challenge to follow. As I left South Africa in March, a nurse in a clinic jokingly offered me a box of surgical masks since I would be returning to Europe. Yet by the 26th of March, March, with still only a handful of cases detected, South Africa initiated one of the most extreme lockdowns seen globally. A national state of disaster was declared with restrictions enforced by the army and police. A COVID command council was constituted closely linked to the presidency. President Ramaphosa justified the early lockdown with the now familiar epidemiological term, flatten the curve, to buy time to prepare the state health system and learn from the clinical experience elsewhere. Epidemic preparedness efforts turn to repurposing systems already in place for those old endemic epidemics of HIV and TB. An existing cadre of 30,000 community health workers was sent out to call people to test for the new virus and active case finding. This adherence to WHO advice through praise from the head of the WHO Health Emergency Program Health activists who cut their teeth on HIV praised the rapid action and political will, a departure from the infamous delay by Mbeki to provide treatment for HIV. So as a narrative of public health and political success gained steam, others speculated that a slow rise in cases could also be attributed to the persistence of apartheid geographies and social inequalities that separated wealthy travelers with access to private health care and poorer sectors of the population. But in tandem, concern mounted in April regarding the violent nature of the enforcement of lockdown, a further unwelcome reminder of apartheid. 11 black men are alleged to have died. There are anecdotal reports that people were afraid to be tested because of threats of enforced quarantine. Challenges mounted regarding the constitutional position of the National Command Council and the implications for governance and democracy. Crucially, the uneven experience of the economic suffering brought by lockdown rapidly exposed glaring social inequalities in terms of participation in the formal economy and the precarity of livelihoods, with the resultant vulnerability to indebtedness that the work of Deborah James has underscored and that intersects with kinship obligations. The lack of advanced planning to mitigate economic hardship as part of preparedness through criticism for intensifying existing inequalities Hunger emerged as a driving force against lockdown. A government re relief grant was announced and by mid-May, one million people had applied. Finally, accounts emerged that lockdown was compromising other health care. A leading HIV physician reported that his patients were too afraid of the police to attend for routine monitoring and medication. In his words, the health sector was facing a collision of epidemics. Thus, South Africa reached a point of stark trade-offs. In the face of the economic hardship and legal challenges to government, restrictions were eased from the highest level on the 1st of May and then down again in early June. Cape Town has emerged as the epicenter of a surge of COVID cases in recent weeks. From afar, I've read reports from Kailicha in Cape Town, now declared a COVID hotspot, where I first did fieldwork in 2000 at the height of HIV mortality. 
that legacy seems to linger now in the fear of the new condition referred to as corona. Wearing the cloth face coverings that are required by law, people in an informal area have spoken to the media of the difficulties they face in reducing their risk of disease. The challenges of sharing a toilet and tap with other households, the difficulties of shielding when backyard tenants share the site. As one woman put it, at least with AIDS, you know how you get it. And inevitably, as cases surge, the resource limitations in the health service are showing. The state is being urged by activists to broker, broker a deal with private hospitals. In Kailicha, Medicine Sans Frontier has opened an additional field hospital, and there are anecdotal reports that people have died because of pressure on oxygen supplies. A national crisis of testing capacity has unfolded with a woeful backlog, making assessment of the epidemiological curve challenging. Addressing the nation last week as lockdown reached 100 days and deaths rose towards 2000, Ramaphosa was candid that restrictions are being eased as cases are rising, but that a lockdown cannot be sustained economically. He blamed the testing crisis on global su supply chain difficulties and neglect of Africa. He also signaled that the easing of lockdown meant that individual responsibility and compliance with distancing masks and hand washing is now key. His message, play your part. The Minister of Health has called for a grassroots fight against the virus and launched a ministerial advisory committee on social behavioral change with inclusion of civil society. This is an acknowledgement that right from the start, the efforts of civil society groups and local organizations has been a marked element of the social response. Some see this too as a leg legacy of HIV activism. The focus has been on food distribution, but increasingly are there are efforts to hold the state to account, such as for violence, corruption, and unequal implementation of relief measures. As the emphasis on individual behavioral change increases, notwithstanding people's fears that their conditions of life make public health measures impossible to follow, there's a danger that their attention to structural inequalities will recede from view, replaced by a rhetoric of personal responsibility. So let me now sum up. Uh, we think that by contrasting South Africa with Uganda is a productive way forward. In both cases, imagined possibilities at WHO seem a world away from the realities on the ground. It is also evident that each country's respective political history and current political dynamics are guiding the top-down implementation of public health measures. In Uganda, shifting the COVID-19 response to the office of the Prime Minister has legitimized the top-down authoritarian and militarized response. In South Africa, the military has also been present, but President Ramaphosa is attracting praise for strong leadership during the response, enabling him to shore up his own position within the divided ANC. A mobilization of civil society to hold the state to account and to support social relief efforts has been reminiscent of AIDS activism. All this is happening at a time when both countries face additional public health challenges. In Uganda, the incidence of TB and HIV continues to rise. Outbreaks of typhoid and malaria are widespread and Ebola remains a worrying presence in neighboring DRC. In South Africa, TB and HIV are serious and burdensome and these chronic epidemics coexist with other chronic conditions notably diabetes and hypertension. While it's difficult to predict the extent to which COVID will accentuate these health challenges, there is little, that the it, it, there is little doubt that the virus is reinforcing existing inequalities. Paul Farmer, in his book, Infections and Inequalities, detailed how diseases such as TB and HIV AIDS revealed social fault lines. Inequalities of outcome, he wrote, are by and large biological reflections of social fault lines. The situation is no different for COVID-19. Here, it's important to note that the capacity to respond is also shaped by an absolute lack of resources. In Uganda, there was no capacity to diagnose COVID in February 2020. By April, it was only possible at Uganda's Viral Research Institute in Entebbe. 
South Africa is better resourced, but insufficient COVID diagnostic tests are seriously hampering efforts to know the epidemic. For many, it's not possible to know if they have COVID or some other treatable condition like malaria or bacterial pneumonia. The combination of limited testing, a high burden of other diseases and questions about protective factors such as demographics contributes to ongoing uncertainties about local epidemiological realities. However, almost certainly COVID will have very different impacts with political economies and formal and informal public authorities shaping the course of the outbreak. The precise details are unknown, but it's clear that global framings of disease preparedness and response, promoting standardized notions of prepare, respond and recover are unrealistic. They are neither neutral nor scientific, and they have emerged and been shaped by wider social and political processes. The challenge for anthropologists then is how to shift these narratives, and with this shift, move away from confining discussion of the social to concepts such as context and risk. Crucially, we need to find new ways to move ahead from siloed vertical responses shaped by broader global security framings in such a way as to accommodate local realities and experiences of outbreaks and the uncertainties and complexities of social life. We very much welcome your suggestions about how to do this. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's absolutely splendid. It really has taken us uh, to think both about intimate uh, family relations and the whole situation more internationally. Well, I've been asked to open up with a very specific question uh, on, on behalf of, of, of our policy committee, which is whether the panel could start, please, by simply reflecting on how anthropologists can contribute toward and perhaps even influence public policy uh, during a time such as this COVID-19 um, uh, uh, crisis. We should probably just go in order of the speakers, but of course the answer should not be over long but just give us a nice quick solution to this question, please. Uh, over to you, Robin. I think I'm just simply going to say, uh, for heaven's sakes, pay more attention to real people out there. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is done at very high level that, that influences uh, what governments do, which is fine, you know, all the modeling and that kind of stuff. But actually, I don't think they probably really have enough um, input from people who work at the coalface of where you know, where real people actually live if you like yeah, that's i'll i'll pass on to the experts in in this <laughs> this area at this point i mean um david the it's obviously a hugely complex question and multiple phds and books can be written about it and so there is no simple answer um but there are some things we can say which are productive. And I think one thing is where anthropologists, just picking up on Robin's point, where anthropologists are looked to for advice about their knowledge and understanding of what's happening at these very local kind of granular levels. And given the opportunity to speak about how policies might be adapted or amended or shaped in light of the specificities on the ground, things can be move forward in a very productive way. And there's some fairly good concrete examples of that out there in the literature in relation to a whole host of, you know, different kinds of health issues, not just outbreaks and epidemics. Um, and I think actually, like there's a lot of movement there. It would have been nice in a UK context to see more anthropological, you know, more policymakers kind of looking to anthropologists for assistance and guidance, but there are also examples that even within the UK of where that has worked and it's worked very well. So I think overall, you know, the trajectory is right. It just needs to happen at a faster pace. Mm. I'm Thank sure you, you want to add to that, Hayley. Yes, go ahead. I would agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, one always works, walks a fine line in this kind of space because there's a very real danger of, of the sort of instrumentalization of one's inputs and, and you know, them being sort of shoehorned into these ideas such as risk communication and community engagement. And indeed, even, you know, quite often anthropologists are seen as kind of adding context. And, and even there, it's quite easy for one's inputs then to be turned towards this kind of 
quite narrow behavioral change framework. So it's certainly not easy, but I agree with Melissa, there is movement. I think just in my engagement now with the WHO um, process around COVID, I guess there's been another issue that's sort of emerged is particularly with guideline development is the um, a lot of emphasis, the, the whole framework there is evidence-based best practice. So for example, um, being involved in something like guidance for home care for COVID-19, when really hits this idea that it's very difficult to really take on board the pra pragmatic realities um, in which people will be caring for COVID-19, indeed for more severe disease. And when one hits this idea of sort of standard of care, and it's very difficult to actually talk about the pragmatics of care, how people actually improvise, for example, with PPE in the slide that, that M M Melissa showed. So I think even though there's a lot of acknowledgement in private around the sort of complexity of, of social life and so forth, it's often quite difficult to really shift things, yeah. Yes, I understand. There, there are several questions for Robin, but could I just have a clarification, please, um, from um, you, Melissa and Haley? If I understand your talk correctly, if you had been advising the WHO vis-a-vis -vis South Africa and Uganda, would you have simply said, whatever you do, don't do the lockdown? This will cause a disaster to both your countries. Have I understood your message correctly? <laughs> You want me to come in, Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I know you want to push me to, to <laughs> make a simple answer, and I don't think it is simple, really. I mean, I, I think in the South African case, um, you know, the, the, you know, when I speak to to clinicians, I mean, I myself trained as a clinician in South Africa, so people working on the ground, they can. So from a clinical point of view, buying that time to prepare the health system to learn from what was happening in Europe, and indeed now last week the announcement of dexamethasone potentially has huge implications in a country like South Africa where there is actually a factory that produces this drug very cheaply. So some would argue from a clinical perspective that indeed the, you know, the, there was, there was, uh, it was useful to, to buy time, but of course you know, that there's overwhelming evidence just of the enormous suffering. And I think we laid that out in the talk. And of course, now this, this, these predictions that more people will die from what are called secondary health impacts of malnutrition and so forth than might in fact die of COVID. But of course, there's enormous debate about the epidemiological realities in, in different African countries. So I guess what we're saying is it's, you know, get away from this one size fits all kind of idea. And certainly towards looking to, you know, for sort of future debates about preparedness and response, how can one have proportionate measures rather than these kind of blunderbuss approaches like these extreme lockdowns that will certainly has been seen in South Africa. Yes, yes, thank you. And did you want to comment on that one, Melissa? Well, I mean, um, I guess everything that's happening in Uganda, I mean, it's obviously a very different situation from South Africa. I think one could have made us quite a strong case for the initial closure of international borders uh, and very specific measures which would have sort of restricted movement. But the sort of uh, ferocious militarized response, I think, is counterproductive. Uh, creating all sorts of additional health challenges, creating all sorts of tensions and, you know, fueling uh, violence in all sorts of ways in the longer term. So the current implementation is, uh, leaves a, a huge amount to be desired, yeah. Yes, thank you. Indeed, there's a comment from, from, a, from, from a, 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 a person who lives in the area, uh, Kahinda, and he says that more people have died in Nigeria from other diseases than have died from COVID-19 because of the shift in resources. Um, well, there we are. We'll come back to these issues. But, but um, uh, Robin, with regard to with regard to your um, uh, talk, there's a question which has come right to the top of the pile, which is which is um, how can you possibly acquaint your your approach with with, with cross cultural variation? Um, uh, what kind of methods enable you to talk with such confidence in this generalised way? Um, a, a very good question, actually. Um, I, I, in reality, I mean, a lot of this stuff has been done cross-culturally. I mean, I'll just give one example. Uh, um, I mean, there was one question asking how, how we actually do this kind of research. Well, one way of doing it is to watch what people actually do um, out there, if you like, in a sort of tried and tested field observers, anthropological, fas ethnographic fashion. Uh, and indeed, we've done those kind of studies. But the the... Uh, one example I was going to mention, um, we were interested in 
for other reasons really, where people uh, touch each other and allow uh, others to touch them, um, really in relation to the quality and nearness and type of, of relationship. So we asked large numbers of people to sort of color in a map of the body front and back as to where these things were possible. And it was done over, I think, five European countries, Finland in the north to Italy in the south, Britain in the west to Russia in the east, plus Japan, being as various people asked about Japan. And yeah, there are little differences here and there uh, between the different cultures, even within Europe. Um, interestingly, um, in, in answer to, to, to the specific questions being asked about Japan, uh, the Japanese were much closer to, 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 to the British than to any other European country. Uh, 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 something I've always felt to be the case ever since I first went to Japan. There's something about island nations or something um, uh, that makes them sort of uh, uh, peculiar in that way. Um, uh, but everybody was pretty much the same. You know, the, the kind of rules that regulate where you allow somebody to touch you or where you're comfortable being touched by people really depended on how close the relationships are. And, and, and sort of strangers, it's all at arm's length, you know, hands only, which is presumably why we shake hands with strangers rather than, well, maybe if you're Italian, you throw your arms around them and give them a couple of air kisses or something. But, <laughs> Certainly in Britain, heaven forbid, we, we politely shake hands with them. So, so I, I would say that's a very cross-cultural. And I, I kind of am always inclined to point out really at, at this point that I'm the product of, uh, a, a, of a multicultural environment. I'm, I'm bilingual in a Bantu language and I'm tricultural from growing up in Africa. I'm deeply immersed in three cultures as well. So I know, really know very well what, what happens in both at Bantu and in Indian in Indian cultures at first hand. So, um, you know, I, that's very important in kind of framing how I do my research because I'm always kind of thinking, well, how do, how, how do these other cultures do it as well as the one I happen to be in now? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. And on, on the earlier point you made about uh, gender differences, um, of course, we're always a bit worried about making such, such uh, generalizations as well. But, but for example, Surely many friendships can piggyback on other forms of social interaction. It doesn't only have to be touching and grooming. Uh, we can have the same effect. I mean, couldn't someone rekindle a whole host of business relationships, for example, uh, from home using new technology and that rekindle friendships, for example? Yes. Well, it, it might do it if friendships are involved, but business relationships, you know, aren't necessarily... Uh, your close friends, they may be sort of sitting in the in, in, in the outer uh, uh, layers of your friendship network and that you, you know, very happy to go and have a dinner with them when you get when you sort of visit their, their offices or whatever it may be in another country. Um, but, you know, I'm really, uh, my major interest in this context is this close set of friendships. It perhaps extends out to maybe 15 or 20 people at the most. And what we've not appreciated really until the last 15 years only is just how important that group of people are for your health and well-being. There is absolutely torrents of research now that's come out uh, in the last decade and a half showing that the most, single most important factor affecting not only just your happiness and well-being and, and, and so on, but your psychological health, your, your mental health, and even your physical health with how, how likely you are to, to sort of get down with a, a winter cold, how quickly you recover from, from surgery for some major intervention, even your risk of dying uh, are influenced by the number of friends you have in those, those inner circles. They are hugely important. And just kind of going back, I think, to the first question, I might just add into that, that I thought it, well, it sort of struck me relatively recently because I've sort of not kind of appreciated it despite living among <laughs> these people in these disciplines, as it were, that there's a very great tendency for psychologists in particular to see the social world as completely dyadic. Uh, and therefore the only possible relationships of interest are uh, you and your mum primarily and you and your uh, romantic partner. And that's the end of their social world. <laughs> when in fact, actually it extends out beyond that to, to a wider group of people who have enormous influence on, you know, literally your physical and your mental uh, health uh, and well-being. And I think that 
kind of, you know, that difference between sort of having this very narrow view of uh, sociality and having a kind of wider, um, a dare I say, eth ethnographic, uh, anthropological view of what the social world means really is something that, that uh, is actually very important and probably has been missed. Hmm. Thank you. I don't know whether other two panelists want to comment on Robin's responses at all. Is there anything you'd like to say? <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, well whilst, you're, whilst you're thinking about that, there is in fact a very important question here from, and forgive me for uh, perhaps pronouncing your name wrongly, but, but, but from Chia Tang. Uh, and she asks, uh, why uh, can't um, the WHO provide more nuanced responses. So she says specifically, uh, given that the WHO is one of the principal global health institutes that's been shaping health policy in the global south for decades, why can't it provide a COVID-19 response framework that is realistic for developing countries? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. How would you respond to that one? <laughs> <laughs> this is indeed an excellent question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's, you know, the WHO, there are many diverse people and diverse groups, and it doesn't necessarily speak, you know, people have very diverse views within the institution. So it's not that everyone within the institution would take the view that the creation of these technical guidelines is the sort of be all and end all and that they must be followed by rote. There's all sorts of critics within the institution who would like to see something a bit more flexible. But there's a broader kind of politics at stake, I guess, which kind of constrains what is possible, what is viable, um, which is perhaps less obvious or avert to those watching on but we definitely saw it during the Ebola outbreak in um, West Africa, in which there was again a very a global militarized response, if you like, which was sort of reinforced by, at a country level by the military, um, and very much sort of shaped by a wider sort of global biopolitics about how different lives matter. Uh, and it was all much more about protecting, you know, Western Europe and America from Ebola than it was ever about trying to engage and, and really um, protect the lives of people sort of at the sharp end in West Africa. And it took a long time before that started to shift. Uh, so that, that is part of it. But Hayley, you've had sort of more recent engagement with WHO and many other things. Do you want to chip in? Mm. I think it's interesting to watch how, you know, this whole global, the sort of pandemic experience of COVID-19 is, is generating a lot of debate about, you know, yeah. there's increasing recognition that preparedness and response are indeed also political processes. So I think it's interesting. I think they, they, there is an, an increasing recognition that, that, you know, that one cannot just have these sort of neutral, this idea of these neutral scientific phases and, and processes. I mean, I think with respect to, to guidelines and, and nuanced responses, and another thing that's quite interesting to see is, is uh, you know, a lot of discussion now about, um, you know, sort of the future going forward. And on the one hand, there's definitely, you know, people sort of praising what happened in Asian countries, so sort of calling for more of that kind of top down, you know, the pillars, more case detection, more surveillance. But then there, there are also other voices, which I, I think are louder than I've heard before around questions around localization, adaptation. And I guess WHO always has this narrative that they coordinate. And I think increasingly, certainly, um, in listening also to the other humanitarian actors or the bilateral donors, there's, there's a lot more about talking about who are the other actors involved, you know, and this, this whole discourse of, of localization is quite interesting. And I think, um, you know, maybe an acknowledgement that these local social responses are also important and, and sort of how does one, one also support those and can that help to have a more proportionate response? And indeed, I think more discussion of these questions of social justice because they've just become so glaring, um, particularly in, in the context such as those that Melissa and I were, were discussing. So I, I think 
I think that's partly what stimulated us to write this paper because I think this is an interesting moment to to reflect on on where the future might what the future might hold and and certainly it's I think it's a, a lot is up in the air right now. Yes, I mean several. I about, think. Um, no, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say. I mean, it's just sort of restating something in a way, but it's so crucial. Is that there's definitely a space for anthropologists within the WHO. I mean, Haley and I have been invited there many times, and many of our colleagues have too to encourage and develop and create all sorts of guidelines and things. So the space is there, but the issue is how do you move from being sort of siloed into this doing the community engagement or doing risk communication to something much more major and much more fundamental to the sort of delivery of care. Uh, and there, I think we sort of need to also reflect a little bit about not just hierarchies of knowledge and where anthropology sits in the field of global health in relation to clinical medicine or epidemiology or other disciplines, um, uh, but also sort of longer personal histories that come together. So how, what sort of training have the people sitting at WHO or in government actually had? Do they have, what kind of ideas do they have about, you know, what anthropology is and how it might be helpful? Because quite often they're, they, they fall back on training they maybe received in the 70s or the 80s, which is really not you know, way out of date to what is actually happening now. So there's a lot of issues there as well, but a lot of people don't have a very multidisciplinary training as a sort of backstop. And that's, that's a hindrance, I think. Yes, yes indeed. And several of the, our people commenting are worried about miniaturization. So I suppose one thing to say is, I mean, surely the WHO is aware of the power uh, hierarchy here. That if they're not, that is the WHO, if they're not careful, they'll get involved in precisely the kind of the kind of militarization of local society that you've described as taking place in Uganda and is, is also South Africa and perhaps other places in the world as well. So, so are, are they conscious um, that, uh, of the extraordinary uh, physical impact of what they recommend will have? And it's not just to do with drugs and hospitals, which indeed themselves may become militarized. That's another question that we have in, in this process. I mean, how would you regard that as fitting in? Hayley, do you want to comment on that? No, I think that's a, a very good observation. I, I, I'm not sure how much. I think there's always that danger if you, you have this, this sort of idea of, of set pillars that, I mean, very easily, as we heard, can be sort of turned to these quite authoritarian responses and justify all sorts of, of violence and human rights abuses. And indeed, I, I mean, this isn't my field, but I'm sure there are people on the call who maybe work in the space of technology and privacy and so forth. So, you know, one sees the examples of the so-called Asian democracies where actually, you know, huge reliance now on, on technology apps and, and sort of collecting personal data. So I think, I think this is partly, I guess, about acknowledging the, the political nature of these processes is to also acknowledge these dangers rather than operate in the science, this kind of idea of these neutral technical um, responses. And, and, you know, I guess the, the, that's partly what, partly just pointing to that is, 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 I mean, it sounds so obvious, but, you know, sort of even there to try and get anthropology out of just, oh, you will, you will help us with the risk communication to say, well, let's look at how this whole enterprise is framed in this global health security pra paradigm and what, what are the implications of that? Yes. yes well, I mean, I think... WHO is also often in a very difficult position, like we saw with the Ebola outbreak in DRC, that actually uh, to have some sort of effective response, you know, you needed to be able to work with the militia groups. There were like 140 different groups within the Kivus or more than that even. And yet WHO is constrained because it needs to go through government, national government in Kinshasa, which is a long way away from the Kivus and very removed and at odds and fighting some of these militia groups. So if they are then tagged with these state actors, how are they going to have sort of credibility? So there's lots of issues and tensions there which are not straightforward. Uh, yeah. So even with the most wonderful kind of outlooks and approaches, they too are constrained. And I think that needs to be recognized. Mm. Well, thank you. That's absolutely fascinating. And now we have a question for all three of you, which is from Mira Swain, where she asks, is anthropological knowledge enough in itself to affect policy measures? 
So I think what she means here is that can we just, just, can we just develop anthropological skills and, and, and expect to influence policy, or do we need to have something else as well in our armory? And she wants all three of you to answer that question, please. So we'll start with Robin. Uh, I think the short answer is um, life is complicated. The biological world is complicated. The psychological and the uh, anthropological, if you like, uh, social world is even more complicated. And you cannot approach any of these things with uh, a one-track, uh, uh, one-dimensional approach. And so we need the modelers uh, who've been very, very instrumental um, uh, in uh, uh, sort of managing government um, policy a lot at the background here. And, I, and on the whole, do quite a good job. I mean, these, these model, em, epidemiological models are extremely sophisticated now because they're down, down to, at least the ones they use in Britain, are down to the household level. Uh, so it's done on a household by household um, level right the way across the whole country, which is formidable. That's why you need a huge computer. So you need the guys at that end who can kind of um, develop these kind of very sophisticated models. But, you know, you need the psychologist to tell you how people tick uh, psychologically and you need the uh, 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 social scientists and the anthropologists to tell, tell you how things tick um, uh, uh, socially. And, and of course, you need the medics to figure out what they've got to do. So I just don't see any way you could possibly have a very limited um, uh, academic uh, uh, approach to these things and of course that's not counting the politics because the problem is we have to implement these in real societies and there's a sort of a, a absolute a, a comment on, on the last question really um, uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek I'll simply say our problem is our societies are too large and uh, it's time we went back to small scale local societies and then it would be much easier to implement a lot of these things but once the you know, your, your, the size of your country gets very large, geographically and uh, numerically, it becomes increasingly difficult to persuade everybody to toe the, the same line. And, and you know, it, you're kind of forced down the route uh, of, of imposing your will as a government or, 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 on the people at large, militarily or, or otherwise. Thank you. What, what, what do you think, Minister, about whether or not we need more skills than just being anthropologists, or, or how would we approach thinking about that? Well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, I think anthropologists need to be open-minded. They absolutely don't have a monopoly of insight, uh, but they ought to be central players at the table. And I think uh, in global health, we need to, with our open-mindedness, seek new ways to integrate insights from the biological and the social sciences, rounding that in an understanding of political economy. And you could argue that to some degree, that's what biosocial anthropology attempts to do, actually. Um, and we have a whole new committee that will hopefully be opening up to engage with those issues. Um, so yeah. But that in and of itself is actually requires working with multiple, very different kinds of web methods and, you know, in a very engaging with multiple disciplines. Yes, I mean, partly what you said, it strikes me, is that we also need a very deep knowledge of the countries that we claim to be talking about. Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, which yes. is in itself uh, slightly different from just pure yeah. anthropological theory. Um, but what do you think, Hayley? I would agree completely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, interesting, the way the question is phrased it is, it was almost implying, do we need a range of skills? personally, which I guess is a, is a different question, maybe what Melissa was talking about. But I think certainly, as we all know, and I would agree, there's been a lot of comment on the composition of these scientific advisory groups. I, I, I know people have also felt that, you know, the social sciences have been predominantly represented by behavioral scientists, but I think that has, has shifted um, with time as the epidemics unfolded. I mean, uh, and I think perhaps the crucial thing is that if we engage in those spaces as a, as anthropologists, we really have to learn how to communicate the value of anthropology, because I think that is, is sometimes not always understood. And we, and we can't, as Melissa said, just assume we, we have a monopoly of insight. We have to, just as other, in those spaces, everybody has to be respectful of the important contribution of others. I mean, that's stating the obvious. Yes, yes, thank you. I sometimes wonder whether we shouldn't all go off and become, I don't know, politicians or do something else completely different and then come back into an, an, an anthropology again. Um, but look, um, 
Robin, you, you've touched on this, but we have a very detailed question here from Barbara um, Pieta, um, who really wants to, as it were, I suppose, challenge a bit here. She says um, that, that her, her hypothesis is that the precarious status of people, such as young researchers, has already pushed them into developing new ways of nurturing remote but dear friendships. So therefore, the precariats of today has already developed friendships in which physical proximity of the body rarely materializes. Nevertheless, they can be a source of deep care, emotional closeness, and practical help in need. So I don't know uh, whether you think that you could reply to that. <laughs> yep, uh, that's, that's um, a question that's uh, frequently asked, uh, I, I think is the answer. Uh, and the answer, of course, um, yes, this is perfectly true. Uh, you know, there is no question that uh, you can do a lot of these things online using digital media. You know, that is why Facebook in particular is as successful as it is. Um, it does allow people to engage. Uh, my sense, though, from all the research we've done is that while you can meet and uh, build relationships with people on, online, and that certainly happens, uh, in the end, there's something special about being able to sit down with them face to face across the table somewhere. Uh, I, there's, there's, there's an intimacy about that which is almost irreplaceable and, and we kind of really yearn for that in many ways. Um, the, the, you know, the, the internet and digital world is very good, the way I be, come to see it, put it this, this way, is that the digital world is very good for keeping a relationship ticking over um, uh, and stopping its decay or at least slowing down its rate of decay, but that actually in the end nothing is going to stop a relationship drifting down from probably not your best friend, but certainly at one point in your life, a good friend gradually sort of drifting down through the layers and becoming just an acquaintance or somebody I once knew. It may take several years for that to happen, uh, but that seems to be inexorable. Um, so I think, you know, sort of we, we, we should be a little sort of uh, wary of crediting uh, the online world with too much here. And I think that's borne out by the fact that all the surveys that have looked at this have very clearly said the size of people's social circles online is not different to the size of their social circles in the real world. You know, it's not the case that the uh, digital world can sort of introduce you to and buy uh, you large numbers of friends that you wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, yes, a few may be, but not large numbers. What restricts this is not the technology, it's really our capacity to engage with other people and with other people's minds to build meaningful relationships. That's the real limitation. And so I think the confusion arises because if you sort of ask, I mean, if you look, for example, somebody did, did a survey of a million, one, one of the Facebook sociologists did a survey of a million Facebook pages. And yes, there are a few people with a thousand friends on Facebook, but the huge, huge majority of people had somewhere between about uh, 150 and 250. Now, younger people tend to have more than older people. Uh, um, uh, you know, so you might expect the majority of Facebook users to be at, at the top end. But when people have four or 500, which is not uncommon, but it's by no means the norm at all, even among young people, um, friends on Facebook, what they're confusing really is qualities of friendship, which is what Facebook would like you to do, right? Because that's their marketing strategy. But most people know jolly well that, you know, the first 100 or 200 are much more meaningful and, and the lot out beyond that, running out to four or 500 or maybe 600 even, are really kind of voyeurs into your social world. <laughs> They're not very meaningful. You don't know them terribly well. Um, and just as an anecdote on, on this, I, I once had an interview with a Swedish, young Swedish TV host who, who for the purpose of his sort of TV program was going all around Europe, uh, meeting physically all the people on his uh, Facebook page, literally everybody, all, all 5,000 or something that he had, uh, in order to challenge my claim that you can only have 150 friends. And uh, I, I did warn him that, that this was you know, not going to work. And he very uh, um, uh, 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 shamefacedly, as it were, when he 
did presented his results on his TV program and said that actually I was right because he turned up at people's weddings with a, a TV crew in town <laughs> whom he didn't know. They were just <laughs> random people and practically got thrown out of the, the venue and things like that. He said, really, the people who welcomed me in were my, you know, 150 friends. So I think there's a, it's very easy to confuse having a lot of apparent friends on Facebook and with the quality of the relationship you have with them. What this is about is the quality of the relationship. Hmm. Yes, I see. Well, there's just five minutes left. And why don't we sort of go back to the, to the beginning again and, and, and go around once more. And now we've had our discussion. Uh, we, we as anthropologists, we all want to, 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 to make a public contribution. I mean, otherwise we'd have gone and done something else, presumably. So what are your collected thoughts, perhaps to, to people both be, at the beginning of their careers and the middle of their careers, towards the end of their careers? Uh, how can they best make a public con contribution? And inter alia, there's a, a question here that says, should we all develop and become digital anthropologists? Is that well, something we can do rather than fighting to get a position in, in, some, in some very select committee somewhere? So perhaps you'd like to give us uh, each of you some closing advice about how we should shape our careers in the next few years. Shall we go in reverse order? Because I used up all my, all my time. And <laughs> all right. we'll go, we'll go I think that's an excellent order. idea. <laughs> yes, right. Hayley, you start then and we'll go backwards. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, I guess, you know, institutionally, I guess, you know, some people might feel more pressure to, to, to think about how to shape careers. I mean, I, I guess what strikes me again and again is just the value of, of just good quality research and from an anthropological perspective of good quality field work. And then, so, I, I mean, I, I think in, in that sense, you know, go out and, and do good research, but I think perhaps the skills that, that are developed less is, is that ability to then translate it beyond and to argue for its, its value and, you know, in something like the present pandemic to say, you know, what, what about, you know, what I've learned about um, care or about rural urban migration in South Africa or about, you know, how people understand kinship or social networks, you know, how, how is that relevant now to thinking about shielding or, you know, it's that and, and it's, it's not, not always easy, but one still needs, the, one still needs quality ethnographic research to, and, and particularly because, as Melissa said, you know, when one goes to WHO, there's a, there's a particular hierarchy of knowledge. It's the evidence-based medicine paradigm. So, so it's hard to argue for the value of a, of a what they would say is a, a qualitative a method. So, so one really needs to be able to come with good solid ethnography and argue for the value of that to make that step to translate it. That would be my observation. <laughs> well, thank you indeed. And what do you think, Melissa? Well, I completely agree with Hayley, of course. Uh, nothing beats high quality research. One should never forget the bubbles that we all live in, actually, uh, but particularly the bubbles that policymakers live in. They often would love to know a world beyond their work and their immediate home, and they have no time, no space, no means to do so. So actually coming forward with that high quality research is typically very welcome. So I guess for younger researchers, I would say, don't be shy to put yourselves forward. Don't be shy to contact people. You would be amazed at how much people want to know what's really happening. They may not be able to do very much. They may be very constrained, but they're not going to forget and they'll come back to it at that moment when they think that they can actually sort of work with it in a productive way. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, one's in a much better position than people imagine if you're in a higher education institution, because with that becomes independence and you have the possibility to say to say it how it is and to walk away and for your livelihood not to be threatened. So often it's easier to have an impact in academia actually than it is within the institutions which are trying to write this policy. So be anthropologists and get stuck in. Mm. Well, th th thank you, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, Robin, what do you think? Uh, I think I, I, I'll just make three points actually. Uh, but essentially, they're the same points that, that, that uh, Haley and Melissa have both been making. Uh, my view has always been 
you know, we live in a most extraordinary complex and fascinating world, you know, whether it's the animals or the plants or the humans, uh, you know, it's full of a zillion interesting, fascinating questions and projects. And you just have to be excited about something uh, that makes you get up in the morning and keep collecting data and making observations and thinking about them and, and coming to conclusions and developing theories. And I, my advice always is, you know, that's the most important thing. Find something that really excites you and just, you know, from morning till night, invest in it because, you know, A, it's a great pleasure to do and very exciting. It can be very hard work and, 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 and frustrating at times, but it's really intellectually exciting. And B, in the end, the quality of your work will be reflected in the fact that eventually it will have impact. That's how you have impact is, is by the sheer quality of imaginativeness of your work. You know, and you do have to work at it. You know, you, you cannot be win uh, Wimbledon or, or, or some other great uh, championship simply by turning up on Saturday morning to play in the final. You have to spend the whole year practicing <laughs> breakfast till dinner time, day after day after day. Um, and that's, that's, you know, how we have to uh, do our work. But I think uh, um, the, 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 really the second point uh, from, from there is uh, simply that uh, everything, all this sort of really fancy, clever modeling and stuff that's done in the context, for example, of the current uh, pandemic, all that depends on the quality of the basic observational information that goes in to provide the assumptions. Make, you know, the models are based on assumptions and the assumptions is what we have to provide. That is what ethnographers or behaviorists or whoever actually provide, if you like, because, and, and the quality of the models, how good they are at predicting what will happen, depends entirely on the quality of that information put in. Otherwise you get a very well-known phenomenon in science, which is the GIGO model of modeling, which is garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so everything hinges critically on the hard, legwork that people like ethnographers and anthropologists and so on do to provide the basic understanding of how societies work. And then I think in the end, if you, if you want to have impact, aside from the fact that good work will always eventually shine through, and that's the essence of, of how the system works, if you like, uh, you can do much worse at helping that by getting out there and writing popular books that people buy and read and, and things like that. Because in my experience, A, that's a great pleasure to do, but B, uh, it's a way of engaging with the rest of the world and getting them interested in the kinds of things you do and you know, sort of uh, explaining why uh, we should do more of it <laughs> and have more people doing these kinds of things. So yes, go forth and write populist books. <laughs> Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Well, I've enjoyed myself enormously. I hope you have as well. Uh, we obviously, we thank our speakers. We thank Hany and Emma for setting this up so beautifully. And uh, we've got, if your question wasn't asked, please don't worry because we've got an, another um, a group of seminars to come, which will give us ample time to build on these themes. And please, please, please consider becoming a fellow of the REI um, to help us all help the discipline flourish further. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>